airbrushes. For some, it's a tool to be feared. For others, it's an essential tool to unleash their creativity onto a plastic canvas of models that we use the game with. If you're thinking about picking one up or surfing to find out more information about airbrushing, then you come to the right place. And who better to learn about airbrushes than from someone who actually manufactures them? Check it out. Hello fellow hobbyists and friends. As some of you know, I filmed a series of beginner videos a while back about airbrushing. Since then, I've picked up new tips and techniques as well as breaking out some of those nasty habits when using an airbrush. I've been wanting to reshoot that series with all the updated information. However, just earlier this year, I was lucky enough to be able to film a seminar taught by a friend of mine. Now, I know this is a long video, but there's so much great information here that should be passed on to other people in the hobby that I've decided to pretty much leave the whole seminar intact. As this was filmed at a wargaming convention called Adepticon, it was mainly directed to those in the wargaming hobby. But all the information here applies to other hobbies and industries that use airbrush. So, grab a cup of coffee or tea, sit back and relax, and enjoy the show. So without further ado, here's Ken Sheffield, the president of Badger Airbrush Company, and his introduction to airbrushing seminar. My name's Ken, I own Badger Airbrush Company. Badger's a family-owned business um, that has a kind of a neat story that I don't mind telling, and that is uh, uh, my grandfather and my father used to make screw machine parts in the 60s for Pache and Theron Chandler and Wold Airbrush. And my dad was very interested in airbrush design and now whether you buy Badger, Iwata, Pache, Grex, all of them have Teflon seals in them. My father is the person who introduced Teflon seals to the airbrush industry. And he took his initial designs to Theron Chandler who didn't want to do it. My father did not want to lose that customer for his father and uh, kind of let it go. About a year later, a gentleman that I used to call Uncle Augie when I was a little rug rat came to my dad and said, I think I can sell your airbrushes. Well, he was the former sales director at Theron Chandler, who had a falling out with George Theron and left the company. And uh, the irony in that story is that 12 years ago, I acquired the Theron Chandler company, who didn't want to do my dad's designs originally. So, interestingly, they were acquired through litigation because they stole our trade secrets. Um, so, <laughs> go, fi go figure. Um, I am 48 years old, so is Badger Airbrush Company. I am without question the inspiration for the business. Okay. <laughs> My father would tell you without question I was the reason for him to get out of the house, so he started an airbrush company. <laughs> uh, so. um, neat thing about Badger, um, for those of you that it matters to, we are a true, genuine American manufacturing operation. All of our airbrushes are made here in the United States. The neat thing about Badger is when my dad took Badger full bore, uh, my grandfather closed up the screw machine shop. And what he did was he took the seven foremen that he had, there were eight in total, my dad being the eighth one, and he gave them each a group of equipment and a customer list. And he said, you guys all have your own businesses now. The way you pay me for your business is you give my son his parts for free for three years. And that's how Badger got off the ground with, uh, with minimal capital uh, investment in doing that. Of those seven uh, suppliers, six of them still make the components for Badger today. They all do it within a, about a 20 minute ride of our factory. Some of them are relatives and the others are very good friends. Some are both. Um, but uh, that's just a little bit about Badger and what we do. And uh, like I say, we're very proud of it. And uh, you're always welcome to come visit us. Uh, Usually it's best to do it between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. because we're actually working during those times. Um, the factory starts a little earlier and the offices close a little bit later, but between 9 and 3, there's someone at the front door and people in the factory actually working. So our paint products we make ourselves as well down in Dallas, Texas, um, which is where our chemist resides because his wife had a job down there. So he didn't want to relocate, but we wanted him to be our chemist. Um, so our paint products are made down there. We only started making our own paints three years ago. The gentleman who is our chemist was formerly the chemist for Createx paints, which some of you may be familiar with. He worked there for 20 years, and when they went through an ownership change, he didn't want to stay there any longer, so he approached us about making paints for us, which prior to that, we had paints, but we didn't make them, so. Um, I don't know everything about airbrush, but in 32 years, I've seen a lot. 
and uh, what you're going to get here today. Uh, well, I should point out, I'm a baseball card collector. I'm not a gamer, okay? If you want to know what color schemes to use on your armies, the gentleman behind the camera uh, over here on the right is Chung Chow, and uh, he'd be happy to help you with those type questions. I'm going to talk to you about airbrushes. So um, for those of you who have airbrushes already, what we want to do is make certain that you have the right airbrush for what it is you want to do. Um, and if not, guide you into what the right airbrush might be if uh, what you have isn't working for you, for what you want to do with it. For those of you who might be considering airbrushes, we want to make sure you get off on the right foot. And uh, we want to give you some guidance into, based on what your aspirations are, um, what airbrush would be best to accomplish that. Um, that being said, uh, one of my rules of thumb, just so you know, is um, when you're looking for an airbrush, it is not a graduated process. Okay, you don't start with this airbrush, then go to this airbrush, then go to this airbrush. Airbrushes are made for applications. You figure out which airbrush best does your application, that is the airbrush to get and to learn to use. Okay, some of the things that uh, uh, if you're paying attention, uh, you'll pick up on is that if your budget allows for only one airbrush, but you have two applications, which one's the right one to choose? Um, because uh, there, there are instances where one airbrush can do something, another, um, another app, airbrush's application, um, but it just takes a little bit of manipulation in order to get it to do that, but it doesn't go in the opposite direction. Most important thing to know about airbrushes if you're in the market for one uh, or want to make certain you have the right one is to be familiar with the terminologies related to airbrush. Now, if you've at all investigated purchasing an airbrush, you've probably heard terms like the action and the mix and the feed. So that's the first thing that we're going to cover right now is the three basic terminologies related to airbrush, which are action, uh, mix, and feed. The first of those is the action, and what someone is talking about when they talk to you about the action of an airbrush is what happens at the trigger. Okay, Trigger on a conventional airbrush is mounted on the top of the airbrush. Whether you have a Badger, an Iwata, a Pache, it doesn't matter. A conventional airbrush has the trigger atop the airbrush. On a single action airbrush, like this one here, um, all I do with the trigger is actuate the airflow. By pushing down, air is going to be uh, on to pass through the airbrush. To adjust my color on this particular airbrush, I would turn this dial at the rear of the airbrush, and that will adjust my spray pattern from fine to white. Okay. Another type of single action airbrush is this one here. Again, I just push down on the trigger, I moderate my color flow in this case by turning the cone at the front of the airbrush. Some of you may have Pache H airbrushes. That's what type of airbrush this is. We'll cover that in a second. Okay. This is a Badger 350 in case you're wondering. Okay. The alternative to single action, which is just operating air at the trigger, is double action, in which you still operate air at the trigger by pushing down, and that's always your first action. But you also moderate your color flow by sliding the trigger back and forth. Okay. I will tell you right now that 99% of what I see at this event requires double learning to use double action airbrushes to do it correctly. Okay. There are single action applications, so we'll cover both. Okay. But most of what I see here is dual action. Okay. Because you need the ability to vary your line while you're working, which leads me into why you would choose one or the other. Okay. If all you want to do is take and paint structures and pieces all one color with a good uniform coat of coverage, all you need to do that is a single action airbrush because essentially what you have is a fine-tuned spray can. Okay, You would set your spray pattern, in the case of an airbrush like this, you would turn the dial to set your spray pattern. Once you do while you're actually spraying it, you test off on a spray pad and do it. And once you have the spray pattern you want, you just go to town applying your color uniformly around the entire piece that you're working on. Most commonly, that's going to be things like structure and terrain and stuff like that. If that's all you're going to paint and all you're going to do is put uniform prototypical finishes down, all you need to do that is a single action airbrush. Much easier to learn to use. I shouldn't say much easier. It's easier to learn to use. Okay? And generally, it's a less expensive airbrush because there's fewer moving parts. Okay? A double action airbrush is more applicable to what I see here in most cases because this is the airbrush when you're an artist who has chosen a canvas that may be a little uh, figure that's this big to paint on. OK? 
okay? You need the ability because of some of the gradations of color that you want and some of the effects you want to create line work wise and stuff like that to vary your line while you're working with the airbrush. Okay, so as you're spraying, you want to vary your line from fine to wide and that's done by as you're working with the airbrush, sliding the trigger back and forth because each time you slide this back and forth, the further you slide it back, the wider your spray pattern becomes. The more you slide it forward, the finer your spray pattern becomes. So most of what I see here, you're artist, okay? You're painting, your canvas just happens to be a fine scale figure. So if you want to be an artist, look towards double action and learn to use it. If you're just going to put color down on something, good uniform coat, single action is easier, okay? And that's going to lead us to mix. And what is meant by mix is airbrushes spray dots, okay? Um, I use the analogy of pixels on a computer screen, okay? Um, you have two different types of mix. You have internal mix and external mix. Internal mix means air and color mix inside the airbrush. In order to spray dots, it atomizes the color. So air and color have to come together for that atomization process to occur. On an internal mix airbrush, that atomization process takes place inside the nozzle of the airbrush. So in the case of this airbrush here, which is an internal mix airbrush, I would take and attach a color reservoir like such. Obviously there's no color in here. Color would enter the airbrush here, mix with air inside of the nozzle, atomize the color and spray it onto your surface. Okay. The alternative to this is external mix. And external mix obviously means that air and color mix outside of the airbrush. In the case of the external mix airbrush, which there's only two readily available external mix airbrushes on the market, the Pache H and the Badger 350. Okay. In the case of the external mix airbrush, you attach your color reservoir again to the bottom of the airbrush. All external mix airbrushes that I know of on this planet are bottom feed airbrushes. We'll talk about feed in just a second, but just so you know. Um, color again is pulled into the, uh, the airbrush here, but it mixes with air out in front of the airbrush. Now the difference between external mix and internal mix and the dots they create is external mix provides a larger, coarser dot pattern. Okay, So it's better for more voluminous uh, finishing. If you want to paint a wicker chair, all you're going to do is lay down heavy coats of color on terrain and stuff like that. And you want good, quick coverage and you happen to want to do it with an airbrush. An external mix airbrush would be the ideal tool to do that with. Okay. <clears throat> internal mix, again, comes back to being an artist and going back to the analogy of the computer screen and pixels. Your internal mix airbrush is your high res airbrush. Okay, it sprays finer dots. Okay. Now, when you're using an airbrush because it sprays dots, you're manipulating those dots. You're determining where they go, where you want to direct them to get the finishes that you want. It is much easier to create what you want to create imagery-wise by having finer dots to manipulate. Okay, So that's why it becomes the more artistic uh, of the airbrushes because the artist has more control over the finer dot of the internal mix airbrush. If you're in a situation where this is one of those points where different airbrushes for different applications, okay, um, if you're doing applications that might require internal mix and it, external mix for different aspects of it, okay? Choose the internal mix airbrush if your budget only allows for one. Reason being is I can never shrink my external mix dots down to the size of the internal mix airbrush dots, but I can always spray more internal mix dots. And that brings us to the final terminology related to airbrush, and that's the feed uh, of the airbrush. And what that refers to is where color enters the airbrush. And there's four different types of feed for an airbrush. Um, there's bottom feed, gravity feed, side feed, and badger dual feed. I say badger dual feed, that's the only time we get a little infomercial in here because that's something exclusive to us that's patented. So anyhow, uh, that'll be the last one we cover. We'll cover it for about half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I see, you chuckled, I saw that. <laughs> okay, anyhow, um, the first thing we want to cover is bottom feed. and. As the term bottom implies, that's a situation where we attach a color reservoir to the bottom of our airbrush. Okay, This enables us to use larger volume of color when we might need to do that for larger pieces, larger structures, stuff of that nature. This airbrush 
then siphons the material into the airbrush and sprays it out. Because of the bottom feed function, I need to create enough pressure to siphon the material as well as spray it out. And we'll cover that a little bit more in just a second here. Okay, so bottom feed, attach color to the bottom, siphons it into the airbrush and sprays it out of the airbrush. Alternative one to bottom feed is gravity feed. My gravity feed airbrush, I have a color well on top of the airbrush, okay? And I'm just gonna put my color right in the top of the airbrush. Gravity will pull it into my airstream, okay? Because of that, I'm able to work at lower pressure. And we'll explain the benefit of that in just a second when we explain why to use one or the other airbrush. Okay, so gravity feed color goes into the top of the airbrush and uh, all I need to do is spray it once it gets into that airstream. Next type of feed is side feed. And side feed airbrush. Got my airbrush, there's a hole in the side of it here. And I can take and I'll attach my color cup to the side, or in the case of this particular model, I can also use the jar, like such. Still a side feed airbrush, okay. Which, oh, that reminds me of something. Sorry, we're gonna backtrack just a second. Going back to bottom feed for one second. A lot of people think when they use this little color cup on their airbrush and it's bottom feed airbrush, then when they use the color cup, all of a sudden it mystically becomes a gravity feed airbrush. It does not. This is still a bottom feed airbrush, okay? We will now return to our previous schedule. Okay, side feed airbrush, which coincidentally, in case you're wondering, this is an airbrush that almost went away entirely a few years ago because this airbrush, its most common use used to be photo retouching, okay? Because photo retouchers, when they use the airbrush, they would work straight up and down. So they needed something that they could take and swivel the cup. Michelangelo, when he did the ceiling, he had to do this, okay, because otherwise he'd spill paint all the time. So. But in any case, uh, Michelangelo did use the spirit airbrush in case anyone is wondering about that. So that's where side feed um, it had its heyday. It started to come back a little bit, uh, automotive painters and stuff like that, because one of the benefits of the side feed airbrush is that Oftentimes, detail artists use gravity feed guns, and many of them find the color cup an obstruction because when they're working in real tight, it gets into the sight line. So the side feed gives them the advantage of getting the color cup out of the sight line. Okay. Now, this is not a true gravity feed airbrush. It's equally artesian well uh, fed, but they can operate it at lower pressures. We'll talk about the benefits of that again in a second. Okay. And then the last feed that's available is dual feed. And what's meant by dual feed is this airbrush right here, this happens to be a Theron Chandler Matrix, okay? And this airbrush, as I hold it right now in my hand, I can attach a jar to it. And it's a nice handy bottom feed airbrush for doing larger general purpose applications, larger volume of color, okay? Yet at the same time, when I get to that detailed stuff where I might wanna reduce pressure a little bit, I can swivel that over and I've got a little color cup on top now because I'm only going to use a couple drops of paint at this point. And now I have a gravity feed airbrush. Okay. Now, let's talk about why you would choose one or the other. And I'll, um, just as I explained with the internal mix, external mix, because of the scale that you're working in to begin with here, 99% of what you're doing, gravity feed airbrush is the better choice for you because your scale is so fine to begin with. Okay. You're already in the category where maximum control is necessary to get optimal <coughs> result. Okay. Now, what the heck's he talking about? What I'm talking about is this. A bottom feed airbrush has got to be operated at a certain amount of pressure to siphon the material as well as spray it. Okay. Generally, 18 to 25 PSI. That depends on the media that you're using, whether you're using solvent-based paints or water-based paints because they have different weights. They need to be sprayed at different pressures. Okay. At 18 PSI, my material's coming out at a certain pace relative to the pressure that I'm working at, and I have to work at that pace, okay? So my bottom feed airbrush, because it requires a higher pressure, forces me to work at a brisker pace. Okay, so I have less control over that tool because the tool's dictating at the pace that I have to work being faster, okay? In the case of a gravity feed airbrush, because I don't need to siphon the material, 
Okay, gravity's pulling it into the gun. I can get the pressure down on this, 8 to 12, 8 to 15 PSI, depending on the media that you're using. Okay, and the benefit there is your control increases proportionately. You can be more deliberate in your movements and, and uh, control with this particular tool. So it becomes an easier tool to get detail with. And what I mean by that is this. This airbrush here and this airbrush here, identical nozzles, nozzles and needles. Okay, what that means is identical spray performance potential. Okay, because they'll spray the same size dots. This one I got to operate at 22 PSI. This one I can operate at 10 PSI. I'll more control with this one. So the detail potential is the same, but it's easier to achieve when I have more control over the tool. Okay, so that's why your gravity feed airbrush is your detail airbrush, your bottom feed airbrush is your general purpose airbrush, and that's how you should um, move decision wise with it. Now, one of the reasons I said for this group, 99% of what you do is best done with a gravity feed airbrush is because this color well on a gravity feed airbrush, if you ever fill it more than a third for some of the pieces you're working on, you are wasting paint. Okay? Which is one of the nice things about a gravity feed airbrush. You can put two drops of paint in there and some of these pieces paint the whole thing. Okay? Now you're going, what? Seriously? Stop by the table. You'll see. Okay, it does not take uh, very much paint. Paint goes further with an, in an air, through an airbrush than any other means of application, okay? And gravity feed takes that even further. Any questions on feeds? Why you would use one feed or the other? Are there uh, cleaning considerations, differences? Not really. We'll clean both of them at the end of this, so you'll see. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to let the cat out the bag too early and have all these people leave. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, but, but no, there's really not. The key is really just don't let paint set up in your airbrush. There's slight differences in what you use to clean the airbrush because one requires the attachment of a jar when the other one does not. But, uh, what about uh, clogging? Again, uh, well, the bottom feed theoretically will have a greater tendency to clog because you're applying your color with a higher pressure. Okay? And again, under that principle that you're drying paint while you're applying it, if you're applying it at a higher pressure, you're going to clog more, which is why um, t-shirt painters, if you ever watch a t-shirt painter, they actually experience tip dry so much that they jack up their pressure to blow right through it. Okay, and what I mean by that is next time you're in the mall, you see a t-shirt painter, you're at the fair, you see a t-shirt painter, go up and ask him what pressure he's working at. I'd almost guarantee it dives to donuts, which I have no idea what that means. Um, I'd almost guarantee you he's spraying over 50 psi, probably over 60 psi, okay? Because he's got to kick out as many shirts as he can kick out per hour, and he just blows right through his tip dry. Now, if he was set at 30 psi, he'd be having tip dry left and right and stuff. As it is, at that higher pressure, he works right through it. Now, the reason that that doesn't work in other applications is this, is when he's working on fabric, that fabric absor absorbs everything that he throws at it, okay? If you try spraying 60 PSI, there are a couple guys that have mastered this. I don't know why they mastered it, but they have and they're good at it. Uh, but on a non-porous substrate, spraying at 60 PSI is, for most people, chaos. Because your material's coming out so fast and you got nothing soaking it up, so you end up with stuff going all over the place, so. Um, so a lot of the reason that they can work at higher pressures is the fabric absorbs everything that they throw at it. There's a far more forgiving surface that they're working on. So. Any other questions on uh, uh, bottom feet, gravity feet? So you yeah. said they, they blow at 60 PSI and they blow right through it. Does that mean at the end of the day that things are bigger bear to clean? Uh, well, they're interested in that mode as well. They never clean their airbrushes. Okay. <laughs> um, what they do, excuse me for one second, can you edit this out? <laughs> um, T-shirt painters, when they paint, probably the best example of this, I've got a good friend, a guy named Jeff Jackson. He goes, if you're in any of the airbrush forms, he goes as Wicked Jeff. He's a fantastic artist. If you're ever at the Chicago Auto Show or the Miami-Dade County Fair, some mega large state fair, Jeff's probably there doing shirts. And... Uh, Jeff uses a 155 Anthem. He has 12 of them. He has the same 12 that he originally had 
from when we first came out with the gun. The only thing he's ever done is change the tip of the needle in, in those airbrushes. And I mean, you can't tell they're airbrushes anymore. They're, they're little blobs of paint that shoot out a thing of paint. Um, but that's the nature of what they do. At the end of the day, they take their bottles off, if they take their bottles off. They put a little red plug over the top of the bottle, don't even take the jar adapter off, and just uh, leave it sit overnight and come out the next day and start spraying again. And part of that is because at that pressure, they can load that gun up and just blast out anything that's been in there. It doesn't have a chance to sit there and do anything. But a lot of that comes back to the fact that they can get away with working at that pressure for their application because the surface that they're working on is so forgiving. There are other applications, you really can't do that. So, uh, because if you're spraying on a bowling pin or a motorcycle tank or a small resin or vinyl model, Forget it, at 60 PSI, you're, you're not going to have much luck yet. So is that a good strategy to clearing the clog, is turn up your air pressure and spray it something else? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's one means for doing it. In my opinion, it's not the best means for doing it, um, especially in applications other than t-shirt painting. Um, I'll give you my recommendation uh, near the end here, and then you can decide which is better. Um, but yeah, you can blast out a clog, you know, and, and that's what a lot of people do. They'll be spraying, they'll get a little tip dry, and what they'll do is they'll blast out that clog on the side. Um, the, the only problem with that is that they probably <coughs> still have some residual material resting inside that tip that my method of not letting the paint sit up and when it gets finicky, just zapping a little cleaner so the gun kind of takes that out of the equation to eliminate the problem entirely rather than... Uh, simply giving you a quick fix that's going to last you for a few seconds and that's going to do the same thing again. Okay, let's get into compressors and air sources and good stuff like that real quick. Um, air sources, four options available to you. First one is Propel, okay? Don't use it. It's Band-Aid. Band-Aid, you get it in the starter sets, you know, great if you're 10, 11 years old and want to find out, you know, if you're going to take to it and stuff like that. Propel is difficult though because from the time you hook up the can and start spraying to the time you're done, your pressure is constantly changing uh, with it. So it's very difficult to have that control element that lets you work at the pressure you want to be working at. Okay. Second is uh, inert gases, CO2 being the most common uh, of those. Great air source. Okay. Inconvenience of CO2 is you got to get the canisters refilled and they're cumbersome. Okay. You can go to local welding shops and dive shops and get that done. Good clean air, that's the type of, uh, we, we do seminars where we do 200 people hands on all at once and for that we rent CO2 tanks. So it's a great source, it works very well. There is an inconvenience factor to it when it comes time to refill that tank. Okay. Third is storage tank. And what I mean by that is if you have a large pancake compressor or something like that already, Go to the local hardware store, Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, whatever your uh, choice is. I don't endorse any particular one of them. Um, get a storage tank. You can fill it off of that compressor that you have, and you could use that good clean air until the tank's exhausted. Go back to the compressor, refill it. Those storage tanks usually have regulators on them, so you can control your air pressure, uh, which we'll get into regulators in just a second. Okay. Um, fourth, and still my favorite, is compressors. Okay, <clears throat> now, compressors, my rule of thumb is this, um, despite whether you're using gravity feed, bottom feed, doesn't matter, get a compressor that's going to give you at least 30 PSI, okay, because that way whatever airbrush you use at any given time, you will have a compressor that's capable of operating it, so, you know, you may be using a gravity feed airbrush, but who knows, you may come to a point in time where you find a good reason to use a bottom feed airbrush and you choose to use one, you want to have a compressor that's capable of operating it. Okay. Now, for me, my recommendation on compressors is based on how frequently you're going to use it. Okay. Um, once you're into the right pressure range and your compressor gives you that capability um, that you need to operate your airbrush for your application, what you want to do is try to make a determination how frequently you're going to do the airbrushing. Okay. If you're only going to airbrush once a month, you know, you can get these little tchotchke uh, compressors, they're not high tech, they're very simple, they're very basic, they'll give you enough pressure to operate an airbrush and they're relatively inexpensive. So you're not expending a life fortune on something that you're going to 
um, do on a very infrequent basis. Okay, if you're going to do it a couple times a week uh, or, or weekly, you know, get something that's a little more durable, a little more uh, capable, a little more. I don't know if high tech's the right word, but a little more industrious. Okay, because you're going to. Uh, over time, that usage is going to add up, and uh, you know you want that compressor to last a long time. And I'm talking about compressors you can get at uh, Harbor Freight Tools, Michaels Arts and Crafts. I'm not a big Harbor Freight Tools fan, just so everybody knows. Um, but uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, places like that. Um, they have nice little diaphragm compressors, relatively inexpensive. Um, a great idea, in my opinion. Uh, it, I don't see a lot of Michaels type shoppers here. Uh, just a couple, but Michaels has a 40 and 50 percent off coupon every once in a while. That's good for one item. There's no better item than a compressor to go buy at 40, 50 percent off. <laughs> but uh, but anyhow, so a good simple diaphragm compressor. If you're just using it, maybe once or twice a week. No need for a tank, okay? Because you're no no sense spending the money, okay, um, on a tank compressor. Which brings you to the last category, which is a frequent user. Someone who's going to airbrush every day, a couple hours a day. Okay. I think in that situation you want to have a compressor with a tank on it uh, for a couple reasons. Primarily because first of all the tank serves as an additional moisture trap which we'll talk about in a second. And secondly it prolongs the life of your compressor because you're working off the reserve that's in the tank as much as you're working off of what the compressor actually generates while, you, uh, uh, while it's building the reserve uh, for it. So your tank compressor is going to last you longer. And in the case of our product line, our compressors are all the same base compressor. They're just with and without tanks. Uh, um, so your performance specs are going to be the same on all of them. Now, as far as compressor manufacturers go, I'll let you know that all none of us make our compressors. Okay, we don't. We're, we're airbrush makers. We're not compressor makers. We all work with similar sources overseas. Um, we have the same conscientious designs. Uh, control that we put into it and we have the same quality standards that we require of our vendors. I know that's true in my case, I believe it's true of my competitors as well. So um, I will tell you this, buying a compressor from an airbrush man of an airbrush manufacturer's brand is not the most cost effective compressor purchase you can make unless you have a 40 or 50 percent off Michael's coupon. Uh, but, um, but no, just keep that in mind, okay? Um, that you know, it, it's great to you know match everything up. If you got a Badger airbrush, have a Badger compressor. If you have a Pache mm -hmm. airbrush, have a Pache compressor. But your airbrush will run off of any air source that's going to give you 30 psi. Okay, so don't get too hung up on you know that's my brand as far as that goes because none of us make our compressors. So I mean, we all conscientiously back up products with our name on it. Don't get me wrong. Okay, but uh, we're not making them. So okay. Any questions on compressors before we move on to regulators, gauges, hoses? Yes? What kind of, uh, of maintenance do you have to do on your compressor? It's a good question. Generally, the diaphragm units that are out and about all over the place, nothing. Plug them in and make sure you turn them off when you're done using them. Okay. There are silent compressors. Um, I'm seeing less and less of silent compressors, primarily because the cost difference has become so disparaging. Uh, in them, in those cases, you do need to monitor your oil and stuff like that. So, um, the other thing is that the diaphragm units that are out, the purpose for the silent compressors is obviously they're silent. The diaphragm compressors have come a long way in their design, so that a lot of the things that created the noise factor that diaphragm compressors had to deal with has been designed out of it. Um, if you want a good example, um, there's a couple people I know in this room that. When Chung was doing his demos over at our table, they thought he had a tank compressor because they couldn't hear the compressor running. The compressor was running the whole time he was spraying, and no one, no one even picked up on that. Uh, so a couple people thought he had a tank compressor and was running off the reserve the whole time. So, so the diaphragm compressors that are out there right now um, from airbrush manufacturers, we have done our design homework. We don't make them, but we do get involved in the design of them. And you know, one of the things we've told the manufacturers is we need something that's quiet because a lot of times people are using their airbrush in small apartments or rooms where you know there's a spouse in the next room and uh, you know she's not happy when I turn the compressor on and the whole building rattles. So you mentioned draining the tank. What, how, how do you typically do that? Uh, generally, on a tank compressor, which you know, this could be a tank compressor. All I have to do is attach a tank to it and run the uh, the 
write wires and not wires, but uh, air passages to do that. At the bottom of the tank, there's going to be a screw. It's a drain valve, and essentially, yeah, I, obviously, I can't show it. Pretend there's a tank here, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and screw it and drain the moisture off, and then just remove it. I was told that uh, if it doesn't have a tank, that the the actual compressor, the motion or the action of the compressor makes the air come out not consistently. Chung, did you have a tankless compressor at the booth today? Uh, yeah. You did? What a coincidence. <laughs> was there a reverberation in your spray pattern? No, you not on that. No? no? Who told I couldn't you that? It. Generally, the airline takes that out yeah. before it ever gets to the airbrush. So, I mean, logic. It, it, now, if I use, well, even this one's too long. But if I use this hose, I might have a possibility. But generally, once your hose is a certain length, that reverberation is taken out. Four different types of hoses. First one is vinyl. I don't even bring a sample of it here. It's right up there with Propel. Okay, nothing that anyone in this room needs to be considering. At this level of interest in what you do and enthusiasm in what you do, you're not hobbyists. Okay, you guys are serious. Okay, so Propel and vinyl hoses are not anything you should be looking at if you're going to consider an airbrush for finishing your pieces. Okay. The next alternative is recoil hose. Benefit to this is that it stays out of your way. If you're in a small workspace, okay, it's nice to have a recoil hose. This hose actually came into being about 20 years ago. Um, Badger had an art consultant who lived in his studio and two o'clock in the morning one night he trips over his braided air hose and takes a, a tumble and decides he's going to uh, create something that's going to keep that air hose out of the way. That's how the recoil hose came into being. All the major brands have recoil hoses now. Pache, Badger, Iwata, we all have recoil hoses. So if you work in a confined space, it's a nice little thing to have uh, if your air hose is a problem. Some of you may remember, I don't see anyone in here really, telephone cords. Sure. That's kind of where that came from. So. But in any case, that's the recoil hose. It's rated up to 60 PSI, so any of your applications are covered with it. So. Next type of hose is the clear transparent hose. And the benefit of this will cover a little bit more when we talk about moisture traps, but the nice thing about this is that if you're in a situation where you're um, on a recurring basis seeing water moisture contaminants coming through your airline, this would help you detect that before it ever got to your airbrush and affected the finish on your model. Okay, um, that's the whole purpose really of the transparent hose. But we sell most of these is actually the bakery industry because of the fact that they have to be overly conscientious about anything that's coming through their airbrush. So they tend to gravitate to the clear hoses just to be on the safe side with it. Other nice thing about this is, is if you're an aquarium owner and you ever have a situation where your aquarium tubing goes bad, um, you know, rather than letting the fish just, you know, die, you could actually take and cut your airbrush holes and you can use the tubing for this until you get to the pet store. Is he serious? <laughs> it would work. Anyhow, that's the clear hose. And still, the world champion the braided air hose. Okay, this hose will handle just about anything. Matter of fact, this hose, if you need to tow a vehicle, okay, and you didn't have something to tie it, you know, chains or anything, you could actually use your braided air hose. Okay, that's a stretch. Anyhow, braided air hose rated to well over 100 pounds, okay, most commonly used, um, available with and without moisture traps, which we'll cover these in a second. Okay, this is a really short hose, I know. Anyhow, so um, nice thing about uh, the braided hoses as of late is that you can get them with quick disconnects. More and more people are using multiple airbrushes because they have multiple applications that they're trying to cover. Quick disconnects are nice. So, so braided air hose will handle anything you want to do with an airbrush. They're available with and without quick disconnects. They're available with and without moisture traps. And that being said, let's jump to regulators, gauges, and moisture traps real quick so you for those of you who are going, what the heck's a moisture trap? Anyhow, regulators and gauges. The biggest thing to me 
when I talk about regulators and gauges is because of the nature of the application that you're doing, airbrush, and wanting to have a, a pretty f a finite idea of where you're at pressure-wise to get the optimum performance out of your airbrush, get a gauge that gives you a rating every two PSI. Okay, You can go a lot of places and get a gauge and it gives you every 10 PSI or 5 PSI. It doesn't really let you hone in on the pressure category that you want to be in. So try to look for something that will give you a 2 PSI um, reading on it. And basically all the regulators work the same way. You have a dial that you'll turn to adjust your airflow um, as it's leaving the compressor and operating your airbrush with it. This to me is still the best place to control your air pressure. I know there's a lot of new gadgets and trinkets out on the market that you know say, oh, you know, you can do this uh, with that. We have them, okay. Um, but this to me is still the best place to most consistently uh, monitor and uh, adjust your air pressure is at the compressor with an air regulator. So, part coming down on the bottom is moisture trap, okay. And what it does is it captures moisture, okay. This thing will heat up eventually, this thing being a compressor. Any diaphragm compressor, because the nature of it and friction and everything that goes along with that, at some point it's going to become warm, which means it's going to generate hot air. As that hot air condensates, it becomes liquid, okay, it becomes water. And that water, if it passes through your airline, ends up on your model. Anyone ever experienced that? Can you tell me when it happens? Yes. <coughs> When it, ha when it hits, it starts running or whatever. Something Wasn't like what I was looking for, <laughs> but when that happens, correct me if I'm wrong, you've just laid the most beautiful finish <laughs> on, on, on the model, and there you are on the last pass, and am I right? Either that or a mosquito lands on it. Well, <laughs> in which case you can shoot it with your airbrush, but, <laughs> um, but, but in any case, I, I, the experiences that I've seen with it is that you just finish the most beautiful paint job, and you go on your last pass, and you get a little bit of moisture that shoots out, and you you have to start over with it. So, so that's where moisture trap is important. Now, one thing that I usually advise people of um, is that if at all possible, get the moisture trap a little bit away from your compressor. Get some copper tubing at the Home Depot or the Lowe's or the Menards or Ace. I don't think I mentioned Ace before. Um, and try and get a little bit away from your compressor so that you're in a position where that air is going to cool before it gets to the moisture trap. Now, in the situations where that's not possible, that's where you can get into things like inline moisture traps. And you also have moisture traps that if you're using gravity feed airbrushes can be attached directly to the airbrush um, as well. So now inline moisture traps, hoses are available with them in there already. Or if you have a braided hose that you want to add a moisture trap to, you can buy the moisture trap separately and install it yourself. When you purchase those, the instructions come with it on how to do it and put it all together. Um, if you're in that situation, the correct way to do it is to make certain that the uh, moisture trap is hanging in a vertical up and down with the drain at the bottom. So when you're using the airbrush, the moisture trap isn't laying in this manner, it's sitting in this manner. Okay. Um, any, uh, I oftentimes uh, uh, like to point out that there are some areas that it is not a bad idea to have a moisture trap on your compressor and a moisture trap in line. If you live in Miami, Florida, <laughs> Not a bad idea, okay? One of the things that I try to preach is if your budget allows for it, take any reasonable precaution that will enable you to succeed with it, okay? So, you know, a moisture trap, for some people, $15 is not a lot of money to have that security that I'm gonna be more successful with it. And generally, that's the cost uh, of a moisture trap is 15 bucks. The hose with the moisture trap retails generally for about 30 bucks, okay? It's one of those things that as you're getting into it, you know, and you want to have success with it, these are little things that you might encounter that you can address on the front end, being aware of them um, to avoid those uh, situations that might make it frustrating for you. So, is there any questions on hoses, air sources, moisture traps, regulators? Yes, sir. The regulator that you had had a moisture trap on it, didn't mm -hmm. it? So do you just have to do them? 
smart thing, or is that enough? well? I was just saying there are certain circumstances um, in, in which it's okay. A lot of that's going to be more dependent on your environment, humidity, humidity. Uh, more humidity. more so than anything. Um, you know, if if you're like I mentioned, Miami, Florida, it's a constant battle um, with humidity in those type environments. Certain times of the year here in Chicago, um, humidity is pretty brutal. Um, if you live in Phoenix, Arizona, you probably don't need either one. Um, you know, but I don't think everyone's going to move to Phoenix just so we can take up airbrushing. And you mentioned getting like a connector between the regulator. And the yeah, it's a good idea to try to get the moisture trap yeah. that is on your uh, compressor a little bit away so that air has a more thorough chance to cool before it gets to the moisture trap. You know, but if, the reason that we don't package them like that is simply because of the fact that it's it's not cost effective. Um, for us to do that we package them so you put them directly on the compressor yet I know the best recommendation is to advise you to try and get something that gets it a little bit away some things you have to do for yourself some things are trial and error and you got to find it out you know uh, one of the things that I'll tell you before the sentence like right now is the only thing we can't teach you is practice okay some things you need to find out some things you need to screw up so you can figure out why you screwed up so you don't screw up again okay um, I mean, there's a learning curve with uh, with it, with anything. So yeah. How far are you talking away? A foot? Nine inches? Uh, nine generally, inches? the recommendation that I hear from guys who you know are, are more knowledgeable about stuff like that than I am is generally about 18 inches 18 is a good distance. Okay. So, yeah. With the uh, reservoir uh, tanks, uh, do you are uh, you still need uh, moisture traps? Huh? Moisture trap is still a good idea, but the tank actually serves as a second moisture trap. And thank you for bringing that up. Because one of the things that I was just about to forget to mention was if you're someone who has a, a tank compressor, which serves as an additional moisture trap for you, always remember to drain the tank. Because if you don't, in a matter of six to eight months, you end up with a rusted out tank. Um, and basically, that's a very costly thing to replace. You're almost in the position to have to buy a new compressor uh, if and when it happens. Thank you. Let's talk about paints real quick. Um, most important thing in this part for anyone who's taking notes is the viscosity rule. And the viscosity rule is this. If you bring your paint to an equivalent viscosity of 2% milk, it should spray properly through your airbrush. Okay. Now if you don't know how thin 2% milk is, um, if you're leaving town on the way out, stop at 7-Eleven, grab a little 2% carton of milk, and you'll have your viscosity gauge. Okay. Now, this is a very important point because a lot of times you get paint brands and they say to airbrush, reduce three to one for the whole line. But you open up a bottle of green and it's one viscosity to start, and you open a bottle of red and it's another viscosity to start, and if you thin them both the same ratio, are they going to come out the same? Absolutely not. So they're not going to spray the same. Okay. So disregard ratios for thinning. Use a visual gauge, okay? 2% milk is the proper viscosity for spraying through an airbrush. Now that being said, I can get just about any type of paint to go through an airbrush, but some are still easier than others, primarily because of the pigment grind that we're dealing with, okay? Um, to go to a Michael store and just grab a bottle of uh, generic craft paint, the pigment's going to present problems for you. Can I get it to go through an airbrush? Yes, I certainly can but it's gonna frustrate me during the whole time. There are paints like that in the field that you're dealing with here, um, where very little consideration is given to the fact that these someone may wanna airbrush these paints. Um, so um, I would look towards fine artist acrylics, the Vallejo uh, model airs are very good, the game colors are very good, Andrea uh, miniature paints, um, which are more for, for historic miniatures and stuff, but certainly that color palette can be transferred over to what you guys like to do. Uh, Badger has a line of pre-reduced airbrush ready paints um, that is, we're in that same boat as Andrea that we nothing's been labeled specifically for you guys, you know, but if you're an artist and you know you can visually connect your colors with what you want, you can make that transition in the existing products that are there. So. If I haven't mentioned a brand of paint that's common in this market, it probably falls under that craft paint category because I'd rather not say the brand. Um, so if you want to know the brand off camera, you can stop by the badger table and I'll tell it to you because I don't want to make any enemies. Um, anyhow, 
So, but um, the viscosity rule, 2% milk, is one of the key things. Second thing is this, okay? Stirred, not shaken, okay? And what I mean by that is this. What is the first thing you do when you grab a bottle of paint? Shake it up. Yeah. Shake, 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 shake. Cool. Um, and the reason you're doing that is because you want to get the pigment off the bottom of the bottle, okay? And shaking does that to some extent. But understand that what you're primarily doing when you do this is simply moving pigment back and forth in base. Okay, you're agitating the pigment. You're not really blending it with the base. Okay. A couple things you can do. Um, if you're on budget constraints, you can get little glass balls or BBs or something like that, drop in your bottle and let that swirling action of that, uh, of that little ball or BB, um, you know, help with the, the blending process. Now the thing that I recommend is replicating the way the paint is filled. Okay, When paint is filled, um, there's a constant blending process going on so that each bottle um, is the same. So the pigment is equally dispersed from bottle to bottle to bottle. Okay, So when you get this bottle of paint and the pigment settled, I am an advocate of using a mixer to blend your paint, okay? Because this replicates what is done in the actual bottling and preparation of the paint before it ever goes to the store, okay? Now, there's a very important uh, proper procedure to doing this, okay? And that is to put the mixer in the bottle, turn it on. You wanna get the bottom of the bottle, get all that pigment up that's sitting in the bottom. Turn it off. And take it out. <laughs> you laugh. I have a tie. True story. Badger Christmas party. At, at the Badger Christmas party, every year we do Christmas ornaments. Okay. And uh, fortunately for me, I was mixing white paint. I had on a tie with Santa hitting golf balls into pine trees and stuff. And uh, Sure enough, I, like a dummy, pulled the mixer out of the bottle and perfect shot of snowflakes going across the tie. Um, but in any case, that's the proper procedure for using the paint mixer. Now, the benefit of using a mixer over the other methods, shaking and, uh, and using the ball, is this. When you are done preparing this paint for use, the pigment immediately starts settling. Okay? it settles much faster when all you do is shake it, okay? Because all you've done is move it back and forth. You haven't blended it, so it's all just dropping right back to the bottom. When you blend it, it's a slower process of falling back to the bottom of the bottle. So if you use this bottle over three or four sessions, you're gonna have a completely consistent bottle of paint every time you use it, okay? Um, not doing that, you're gonna run into situations where you have a greater density of pigment one time versus another because when you get to the bottom of that bottle, you're pretty much going to have a very concentrated paint, and you may even have some problems spraying the remainder of that paint because it's so heavily uh, pigmented at that point. So That's the info on paint, the viscosity rule in shake and not stir. Is there any questions on paint? Yes? You get your viscosity incorrect either in one way or the other. Obviously, if you've gone too thick, you're likely to have your airbrush clog. Um, yes. If you've gone too thin, you just won't have the correct application on your paint. You're not going to get the coverage you like. What do you do once you get the paint into your airbrush to fix it? <laughs> well, at that point, you want to shoot cleaner through the gun and, and get it out of there. Now, um, in the case of paint too thin, what you're going to most, what's mostly going to give you evidence of that is that the surface tension of the paint will be lost. <coughs> It'll pretty much hit the surface and run uh, on it. So that's kind of your indicator that you've gone um, too thin. Too thick, you're absolutely correct. Um, you're apt to experience some clogging with it. A uh, way to do that is get cleaner loaded into the gun. At the end of this, we're going to cover cleaning. We're going to do a quick cleaning demonstration uh, with it. and. Uh, Pretty much what you see there is what you want to do in that situation where you haven't thinned your paint enough and you've got it in the gun and you got to get it out of the gun. So, um, so we'll cover that for you uh, at the end. In the case where it's too thin, 
you know, hopefully you haven't thinned the whole bottle of, of paint so that, you know, you still have something um, that's usable. And that's probably a good idea in terms of as you're in the learning process. And part of the learning process is how to prepare your paint and how to set your air pressures and, and all of those good things. You know, it's a good idea when you're initially doing it to just kind of take it, um, set the paint aside that you intend to use rather than use it, you know, trying to um, <coughs> reduce a whole bottle of paint at once. Um, do it separately so you don't end up losing a whole bottle of paint to, to, to the learning process. So, yes? What do, you, what do you recommend to cut the paint with? Okay, good question, and I shouldn't have moved on without mentioning it. Okay, in the case of water-based paints, which is just about everything I've seen here, water is your thinner, okay? Um, if you're gonna store the paint, distilled water. You're not gonna use it all at once. You're gonna use it all at once, use tap water, so. Um, the Vallejo, the, uh, the Citadel, the, uh, uh, all the paints I've seen here as I walk through are all water bases, so. Um, and the rule there is if you're using water bases, your thinner is water. It is not Windex, it is not alcohol, okay? Now, I know people make that recommendation. It's not wrong for them to make that recommendation because it works for them, okay? They make that recommendation after they've had 15 years of experience and figured out the little idiosyncrasies that they want to do that will work for them. As someone who stands in front of this room and wants to give good general information for people that I believe to be starting off and wanting to get them off on the right foot, I don't recommend you add alcohol to water-based paints. Primarily, first of all, because water-based paints to begin with are very quick drying paints, and they tend to clog airbrushes more frequently. If you add alcohol to it, you expedite the drying time because alcohol dries faster than water. Additionally, if you've ever had an experience where you use alcohol, um, add alcohol to water-based paints, and you don't get it completely out of your airbrush uh, um, before you move on or, or you finish for the day, you return to an airbrush, oftentimes it has kind of a gummy gunk um, on the needle, and that's because uh, water-based paints and alcohol, they'll turn into that, okay, if they're not properly cleaned up. So I don't recommend you put alcohol in your paint. Ten years from now, you may be playing around, you may say, oh, okay, I'd like to dry this a little bit faster, so maybe I'll add a little bit of alcohol. Cool, if that works for you when that time comes. But starting out, go with the stuff that's going to make you most likely to succeed, and that doesn't include adding alcohol to your paint. Ammonia is not a paint thinner. Ammonia is a cleaning agent, okay? Our, our uh, cleaner is an ammonia-based cleaner. You don't use it to thin the paint, you use it to break down the paint, okay? Um, so don't use Windex to thin your paint. No offense, Johnson & Johnson, but uh, um, you, you can use Windex to clean your airbrush. There you go, okay, we're good now. Okay, anyhow, but um, um, yeah, so alcohol and Windex are not paint thinning agents. In the case of water-based paints, water, okay? Um, Solvent-based paints, if you're using them, um, if the manufacturer doesn't have a recommended thinning agent for it, um, lacquer thinners, mineral spirits, uh, well, not mineral spirits, mineral spirits, cleaning agent, sorry. Lacquer thinner um, for thinning those paints. But most of what I see you guys are using, if you're using things that are on display here, you're using water bases, so thin it with water. Okay, any other questions on paint? Uh, which, let me talk about cleaning agents, seeing who brought it up. Um, which your cleaning agents for water-based paint in a pinch um, is uh, 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 an ammonia-based cleaner, okay? Um, one of the things I recommend when you choose a paint brand, look for paint brands that are going to give you tools to enable you to succeed. And what I mean by that is this, is um, look for paints that have retarders, extenders, tools that you can use to adjust the paint to your application in your environment, okay? Paint dries faster in Phoenix, Arizona than it does in Chicago. You're gonna clog your airbrush more in Phoenix, Arizona than you will in Chicago. So it would help you to have something to slow down the dry time of the paint in Phoenix, Arizona so you don't clog as much, okay? So an extender or retarder is a very useful tool, especially when you're starting out, okay? Um, same thing with cleaning agents. Try to choose paint brands that have cleaning agents um, that are connected to the paint because only that paint manufacturer knows the formulation of that paint. So he should be the one to provide the cleaning agent related to that paint that needs to be broken down to clean it out of your airbrush or your paintbrushes. OK? 
okay? So those are things when you're starting out, those are considerations to have as you're choosing your paint brands and stuff like that. You can deviate off later, okay? But, you know, have some fun and succeed with it on the front end, and that's more likely to occur if you take into consideration simple points like that. Thank you for bringing me back to a couple points that I skipped over. Yeah? If you have, um, how, where do you recommend, or how do you recommend mixing your paint to get it into your airbrush? Obviously, if you have bottom feeding, a bottom feeding uh, airbrush, you have a jar. Do you recommend mixing in that jar, and then, or do you recommend mixing elsewhere and pouring it? In the case of the bottom feed airbrush, what you just said is what most people do. They'll they'll pour their mix into a jar and just attach that jar to the airbrush. In the case of gravity feed airbrushes, that, that is nice the flip question. of a coin. <laughs> One of the longest debates I ever saw on a forum, airbrush.com, was in the cup or out of the cup and pour it in the cup after you mix it. Okay? <laughs> because 50% of the people mix their colors right in the cup, 50% did it outside of a jar. So, you know, that's one of those things that I tend to think when you're starting out, doing it outside of the cup is better um, for you because of the fact that, uh, it, you know, in that cup, once you put it in, that's it. You know, uh, you've either got to spray it out and start over um, or hope that you got it right. Um, so, you know, but that's a personal preference. And, you know, over time, you may change the way you do that. Um, I, I would think starting out logically, it'd be best to mix your colors before you put them in the airbrush. But uh, again, I, I don't have a position either way on that, but if, if I were in your shoes starting out, I would probably mix before I put it into the airbrush. Okay. Now, do, you, do you have to be careful with the uh, lacquer thinner damaging the seals? Um, not in any of the airbrushes I'm familiar with. So, I mean, you have to realize that uh, I want airbrushes, Pache airbrushes, Badger airbrushes, Thurn Chandler, Grex, Hotter, Steambeck, they're all used in automotive applications where they're regularly in contact with urethanes, lacquers, stuff of that nature, very volatile materials that um, they couldn't work with those type of materials if they had O-rings that couldn't withstand exposure to those uh, uh, type of uh, things. So. Uh, it, but it, again, even in that example, I wouldn't suggest leaving an airbrush set for a prolonged period with something like that uh, uh, in it, so. Well, I think uh, uh, Cretex uh, put out a, a cleaner, it's actually a two hour soak, is what they recommend. I'm not a fan <coughs> of soaking airbrushes, so. Um, I know people that have used it, it works. Um, I know other people who've used it and say, my own ring's gone, you know, so. You know, you gotta be careful with, uh, with stuff like that, so. I mean, generally, O-rings, whether they're in airbrushes or in other things, if they're seals, um, unless they're designed specifically to be exposed to some type of liquid for a prolonged period, it's probably best not to do that. So, um, the, the, really the only thing that I know that withstands that on a, on a pretty consistent basis is Teflon. Most airbrushes have Viton for uh, um, uh, polyurethane seals in them. So most of them are by time now, which is a little more impervious to uh, soaking, but it still isn't foolproof with it entirely. Okay. Any other questions on uh, paints and the quick rule of thumb and the preparation? Yes. You talk about drying retarders. Uh, was that a good way to prevent tip dry as well? It does. Anytime you slow down the dry time, going back to that principle of your drying paint while you're applying it, um, if you can slow down that dry time, it's going to minimize how frequently you'll experience tip dry. So Does that cause any streaking problems absolutely. or anything like that? No. no. There's a, in the case of our paint, there's a certain amount of the extending agent in the paint that actually would help set the actual dry time for the paint. Now, most of our paints are set up for general usage. You know, so you grab a bottle, um, you know, uh, do a nice uh, base coat or gradation of color. Uh, when you get to the detail part of it, I'd recommend you throw extender into the mix to slow down that dry time because that detail application is going to have a greater tendency to clog your airbrush. So. Airbrush holder, never a bad idea. Um, all the major manufacturers have them. I want a Pache, Badger, Grex has one. Uh, I think Hotter Steenbeck has one. Um, you don't realize you need one until you have an airbrush full of paint and you have no place to put it down. So 
Uh, airbrush holder is certainly a good idea. Uh, paint mixer, never a bad idea. You've already seen how it works. Um, if you're a bottom feed airbrush user, jar adapters in sizes that are relevant to the paints you want to use. Not a bad idea, because that way, in instances where you're not mixing colors and you just want to be able to attach a jar right to the airbrush, you know, there's adapters in 20, 24 millimeter, 28 millimeter, 33 millimeter, 38 millimeter, and 43 millimeter. So whatever brand of paint you're using, there's probably a jar adapter that would enable you to go right from that bottle to the airbrush. Eyedropper lids, especially if you're a gravity feed user, you can actually store your paints in these. Okay, these are available in 33 millimeter mouth size. So you get some 33 millimeter bottles, 33 millimeter eyedropper lids, and they're nice for transferring color to airbrush in the case of gravity feed airbrushes. Um, back to the bottom feed users. If you ever have a situation where you're concerned about the paint that you're using and its ability to go through your airbrush, siphon filters. Okay, What this is, it's a filter that usually slides over the siphon of your airbrush and prevents material from coming into the gun that isn't going to go out of the gun. Okay, And when you're done with that, you just take it off, some good hot water to flush it out, get the paint, to, the, the materials to reflow and clean it out, and it's ready to use again. Anything similar to that for a gravity feed? No. Uh, there is, but I can't legally recommend it. Um, no, there, there isn't. Um, what, uh, what I do know people do um, with their paints before they put them in gravity airbrush, if they have those concerns, they'll take nylons or something Sometimes and run through, run through that and yeah, you know, just throw them away. Don't put them back in the drawer. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, hose uh, um, accessories. That uh, There's a lot of cool hose accessories that are on the market now that are useful. Uh, they're, they're not just gimmicks. Um, if you have a standard hose and you're a multiple airbrush user, um, you now have little gadgets. Badger has them. Iwata has them. So whatever brand you have, they pro you know you can uh, locate that gadget. Um, I can take any Badger hose and just stick this on the end of it, and it's now a QD hose. So if I want to use multiple airbrushes and just have to have one hose, so I don't have to change every time uh, with it, I can take stick this on the end. It's a little QD adapter, and then I can just take and stick my QDs in it, and actually. You know, I guess it's a better visual to do this way, like such. So I can snap this off, put this one on. So these are nice if you're a production painter, want to become a production painter, you're going to be changing airbrushes a lot. And again, these are available for most of the major brands. Same thing with the QDs themselves. Um, they're available for Pache's, Iwata's, Hotter Steambeck's, Badger's, Theron Chandler's, uh, all the major brands. Uh, let's see if I missed any accessories that I want to cover. Oh, this stuff. If you're having a problem with tip dry, okay, this is called Regnag Needle Juice. That's the Badger brand. Super Lube is the Iwata brand uh, of it. This is a material that is developed for coating the needle to minimize tip dry. It puts a coating on the needle so the acrylic paints can't stick to it. Okay. What's and the name of that again? Uh, it's called Needle Juice. Needle Juice. Uh, ours is called Regnag Needle Juice. And, uh, if you notice, Regdab is Badger backwards. Okay, now I point this out for a very specific reason, because I want everyone to know this. My dear friend Gary Glass, who was the marketing director at Badger at the time we introduced this product, thought that it would be cool to call it Regdab because it was Badger backwards. Okay, Gary Glass, my good friend, G-Man, how you doing? Is uh, the current president of Iwata Medea. So, so you know who's doing their marketing. So if you start seeing Iwata backwards on stuff, <laughs> Gary probably did it. So, anyhow, um, but uh, Iwata's is super low. Theirs is blue because they want to color it. Ours is this industrial-looking color. And what it is, it's a non-petroleum, non-silicone-based material. It just coats your needle and keeps paint from sticking to it. So, and it works. It, uh, you can go in any form and ask about it, and people will tell you this is a lifetime supply. The way, in, in, in case you're wondering, this is how you actually use it. Uh, let's see, we'll go with this guy here. 
You simply take your needle, dip it into the needle juice, pull it out, let that excess run off. Like such. Then just give it a nice little soft wipe down so there's just a coating left on there. Put it back in your airbrush. And the material is going to stay on the needle. It's not going to interact with your paint, but it is going to prohibit your paint from sticking to the airbrush. Now you're ready to go. And I tell people if you experience a, a fair amount of tip dry, which usually happens in detail applications more than any other application, because you have to remember when you're um, applying paint with an airbrush, you're drying it while you're applying it. So just the whole principle of that means you're going to clog airbrushes. Okay? If anyone tells you their airbrush never clogs, they're lying to you. Okay? Airbrushes clog. Every one of my airbrushes clog. Don't leave this room thinking that if you buy a badge airbrush, it's not going to clog um, because that is not the case. Okay? And the same holds true for every brand of airbrush. They all clog. So um, the key is to find the ways to minimize how frequently that happens because no doubt clogging is a frustrating part of it. Okay? And understand there's a lot of things that factor into that. It's not the airbrush um, all the time. As a matter of fact, it's probably not the airbrush most of the time. A lot of times it's the paint, it's the air pressures, it's the environment. There are a lot of things that come into play. But what I'm trying to do is give you information that helps you minimize how frequently that happens to you so you can enjoy it rather than be frustrated by it. So, about how often would you recoat your needle with that? Um, I tell people about, act, at, about every four hours of actual spray time. So, What I want to do real quick is go through proper cleaning uh, process for an airbrush. I am not an advocate of disassembly of your airbrush. It's simply not necessary. Okay. I go to uh, trade shows um, much like this, although Chung is demonstrating for me here. I go to model railroad shows and paint box cars, and I'll go all weekend, and I will never take my airbrush apart. And people look, and they're watching, they're waiting for me to take it apart. No need to take it apart. I just don't ever let paint set up in it. Very important thing, whenever you're airbrushing, have a jar of cleaner at the ready. Okay, We're doing the gravity feed airbrush first, Okay, so we want a, a jar of cleaner like this with a little top that enables us to dispense right into the uh, airbrush. So, try this again. Load in just a couple drops of cleaner because all I want to do right now when I start out is spray test it. Okay. I'm going to set this guy on the floor so he doesn't fall off the table. And you can see if you look out against my sleeve there, you should see the spray pattern expand and go back and forth as I move the trigger back and forth. So we're spraying okay. Now in order to clean the airbrush, you have to dirty the airbrush. So we're just going to load a little bit of paint in here. And now what I'm going to do, I want to get most of what's in here out of here. So the first thing I'm going to do, I still have some paint in the chamber. So I do want to spray that out. And I'm just going to blast it full bore and get everything sprayed out that I can get sprayed out. Okay. Now I'm going to take, I'm going to add a little cleaner, just a few drops. And that's so I can wet everything that's inside of the cup that I didn't spray out because it was stuck to the side of the cup. I'm going to take my cloth. I always want to have some paper towels or something nearby for this cleaning process. And I'm just going to take and give it a good spin to soak up as much as I can of what's in there that didn't get out because of the spraying. And you can see most of that's gone. Okay. So now at this point, I want to spray out one more time because I did push something back into the chamber. So I get that out. And now I'm going to go with just a little more cleaner. And you can see that cleaner is a little bit dirty. That means I still got paint in there. So what I'm going to do then, I'm going to take and spray that cleaner out and get most of that stuff out of there. Okay, I've got all that cleaner out. Put in a little more cleaner and now you can see it's clean. I'm ready to go to my next color at this point. Okay. Now, if at this point I notice that there's still a fair amount of color in there, it's probably going to be a little bit troublesome for me, um, so it wouldn't be a bad idea to back flush it. And what I mean by that, and this is only necessary when you don't spray cleaner through the gun and you let it uh, set up in there a little bit, um, so you want to do something a little more thorough. What back flushing it is is this. It's essentially suffocating the airflow to force air back into the color chamber. And the way that's done, 
is you have a needle that's sticking out of the front end of this, so you want to be careful. You take a soft cloth like such and just press it right over the nozzle and pinch it. Okay, you want to be careful not to bend the needle. And if you position that needle between your fingers, you won't bend it. You're just pinching around. And what we're going to do, and that's going to bubble back into the cup. Okay, so we're kind of regurgitating everything that's sitting in that nozzle back in there if we didn't get it all out. Now, I don't want to spray this through my airbrush because I just got it out of there. So I'm just going to take and dump it out onto my cloth, like such. Then I'll give my cup a good wipe. You can see it's pretty clean. And just to be sure, we'll put in a couple drops of cleaner. And you can see what we're At this point, this gun will spray just like when we took it out of the box. Okay. Now, if you do those two things, you should never have to do anything else. You should not need to take apart your airbrush. Okay? And there's no reason at this point to have everything out of here. What, am, what else am I going to do by taking it apart? Nothing. Um, but I understand there are instances that people forget to shoot cleaner uh, through their gun or uh, don't back flush it in time or, um, you know, they're working and, honey, can you come here and give me a hand? You know, and you return two days later and there's your airbrush uh, with paint in it and you're going, oh, crap. Um, it happens. That's the point at which you do disassemble in your airbrush because you're going to need to. Okay. Remember one thing, paint sets up as fast in this airbrush as it does on whatever you're painting. Okay. So as fast as it dried onto here, this is all dry, it would have dried here. Okay. So shoot cleaner through the gun. Okay. If you ask yourself, I just did a little bit. I'm going to be coming back to it in two seconds. So I need to shoot cleaner through the gun. The answer is yes. <laughs> okay. You cannot shoot cleaner through your gun too frequently. Okay. If you want to avoid disassembly and you know trying to figure out how to put it back together when you're done, shoot cleaner through the gun, and then you'll never have to take it apart. Okay. Now, in the instances where you do have to take it apart, only take apart the parts that come in contact with paint. Okay. And on an internal mix dual action gravity feed airbrush, it's from the point of paint entry forward, which is from this color cup forward. Same thing with every airbrush, every brand, whether you have a Pache Talon, whether you have an Iwata Eclipse C, I think is their gravity feed, your point of entry is from here forward. Those are the parts that you need to take off if you have to do disassembly for cleaning. No reason to take these guts off. Okay, if you got paint back here, it's because you either spilled it there, or there's a seal that's gone bad that might need some factory analysis in order to correct. Okay. <clears throat> now, what does that mean? There are three components that come in contact with paint. One is the needle. Okay, you take it out, you set it down. Okay. Your next part is your nozzle assembly. One thing that I will tout about Badger product, it's all finger tight assemblies, no wrenches, no pliers. Sorry, other guys. <laughs> Anyhow, no, it, my competitors make good products, okay? If you ever want to know the difference, stop by my table and tell you the difference is we care more. Plain and simple. It is. I got no problem saying that because I'm the one who cares. Anyhow, so I got my needle out. The other parts that come in contact with paint are my paint tip, which I'm sure you can barely see there from where you are, okay? And my spray regulator, which is the end piece of this two-part assembly, okay? doesn't really come in contact with paint, but generally through the spray process, you'll see some paint on the front end of it, okay? So it, it, it really doesn't cause a problem, but if you're going to take it apart to clean it, you might as well do a good job with that as well. These parts... Now I keep the head assembly, the, the head and the spray regulator together on my cone nozzle airbrushes when I take it apart. These parts here, um, if I have an ultrasonic cleaner, I'll throw it in there. If I don't, a glass of effort it. 
um, we'll do the job. It takes blueberry stains off of teeth. <laughs> we'll take residual paint off of airbrush parts. Okay. My needle, I will inspect thoroughly and uh, with a cloth saturated with my cleaning agent, give it a good rub down. If there's still something on here that I'm unable to get off through that process, the next thing I'll do is run under good hot water to try to get the material to reflow and then try and wipe it off. If that does not work, a very fine steel wool, okay, you will not um, change the dimension on this, uh, the diameter on this needle enough to corrupt the seal by using a fine steel wool to remove that residual paint, okay. And when you're working with the needle tip, you want to take care with it to do things between your fingers, not, not in this manner, in this manner, okay. And again, you're usually going to be pinching a cloth of some type if you want to clean the needle tip. I like to take and lay it into the cloth first and then pinch the cloth about an inch down and then spin it as I'm pulling it through if I have a reason to, to, to do disassembly on my gun. So. Okay, at that point I can take a Q-tip or something like that where the tip rests in here, if I see anything there that concerns me, I can take and swirl the Q-tip. Shouldn't be necessary, okay? Um, because this part, this uh, flat here, is what the tip seals against. Paint goes through here, not around it, okay? But if you want to give it a visual inspection, that's fine. Uh, make sure your cup's cleaned out. It should have been by this point anyhow before you get to this, uh, this disassembly. Now, I've had several people at this event ask me about cleaning kits. I discourage them. Don't use them, okay? Those cleaning kits have hard bristle brushes, okay? If you take that hard bristle brush and you put a microscopic scratch right here, that seal between the tip and that body is now corrupted and your airbrush will not work properly and it is one of the few things that cannot be repaired, okay? Because in order to get that scratch out, you need to smooth it out and you've changed the dimension on this to the point that this will not mate up properly with it. So you've essentially voided the warranty, which is very difficult to do with a bad Euro brush. Okay? Um, don't mess around with cleaning tools. Shoot cleaner through your gun to the point where you never need to be concerned about it. So I'm not an advocate of of those cleaning kits. Sorry cleaning kit guys, but um, and, and I actually put it this way, um, and uh, hey I'm not a yank your chain kind of guy. All that is is someone marketing something based on people's ignorance. Okay, Every one of those they sell, there's someone at a cash register going sucker. Okay, You don't need those things. Don't use them. They'll do more damage to your airbrush than they'll do good. And that goes with, I, I, I and maybe a water doesn't feel this way or Apache doesn't. You'll damage their guns just as much as you will ours by using those things with them. I'm sorry, it's plain and simple. 32 years experience, you know, I know what I see. I can tell when people use them when I get my guns back um, with nasty letters about how now it bubbles or doesn't do this or, or, or does that. And, you know, I'll look at it and I'll write it back a letter that says you used a cleaning kit on this. You know, you corrupted a seal. I can't fix it. So, um, so stay away from those things. Okay. And I know there's people on the forums and YouTube and stuff like that saying to use them. Well, don't. Trust me. They're not going to be the guy you send your airbrush to when it doesn't work properly. Okay, at that point, oh, I should actually go through. At that point, I can do my reassembly. And I always put my needle in first. Such. Now I don't tighten it into place, I don't tighten my needle chuck here, okay? Because I use my needle as a guide for my tip. And you can see the tip's not down in there all the way, it's magically suspended in there, okay? So I still don't tighten my needle, but I back it down now so that my tip can fall into the body, and then I can put my head. And we're only going to cover two airbrushes real quick here, and the second one goes much faster because I don't go through all the assembly, disassembly, because it's pretty much the same. I'm just going to show the back flushing so you can see the difference between back flushing, bottom feet, and gravity feet. Now, at this point, everything's in place. I'll slide my needle forward. Don't force it just till it stops. Tighten my needle chuck, 
and I should be good to go. There we go. And you should be able again to see the bearings of this great bed. We'll find it. Real quick, bottom feet. If you're a bottom feet airbrush user, you always have the following jar of cleaner handy with a jar adapter attached to the top of it. Okay. So we've put some color through the gun, got it dirty. Okay, changing colors on a bottom feet airbrush, best thing to do if you're a bottom feet user is to have uh, multiple jars with your colors and jar adapters on. It's the most efficient way to do it. And again, I understand most of you here for what you're doing, bottom feet is probably not the direction we'd send you in. But okay, take that off. Now we take our jar cleaner, attach it to the bottom. We take and we shoot our cleaner through. Now this is a little bit different in that pretty much once I do this, I'm gonna get the rest of the brown out. At some point, it's going to start coming through clear. Okay. Now, back flushing with this gun, and this is the most notable difference in the bottom feet of the gravity feet, is this. Okay. When I back flush my bottom feet gun, it requires a little bit more than my gravity feet gun in, in this regard. Okay. My back flushing process is the same. I push down and I pull back. And you can see that bubbling into the jar. Okay. Once I do this, I have contaminated my cleaner. Okay. It is no longer my fresh cleaner jar. Okay. It is my back flush jar. And it is my back flush jar for the rest of time. Okay. Um, you don't need a second back flush jar. Okay. What you do need at that point is a second fresh cleaner jar and it will always be your fresh cleaner jar after that. So with bottom feet airbrushes, you need two cleaning uh, reservoirs, and that's the primary difference between the two. Okay. And then after you back flush, again, you don't want to spray your back flush material back through the gun. So you put your fresh cleaner on and shoot it through, and you're good to go. Any questions? Yes. A really basic question on the total. I really want to try this and learn it for. What do you recommend for area preparation? Is there a certain amount of ventilation you got to worry about, or any kind of? Well, ventilation is an interesting thing. Um, the point at which it's most relevant and most of what you guys are doing is when you're in the base coating part of it. Now, when when I use an airbrush and I spray it, um, shortly after I spray it, it becomes dust. Pretty much about seven inches out, it becomes dust and it settles down. Okay, um, spray booth, not a bad idea. Okay, at the very least, the dust mask or rust sprayer. You're working with water-based non-toxic paints, but you have to understand that, that that standard is not set based on the spraying of that material. Okay, so, you know, in a heavy painting session and stuff, it's not unreasonable to have a respirator or a spray booth. Uh, Artograph makes an excellent line of spray booths. Um, that if you're in the market for one or looking for one, not a bad idea. You want to ventilate something like that outdoors if possible. I have seen setups where um, um, guys will set up uh, even corrugated boxes with computer fans and filters to pull that air away. And now they don't have a ventilation source, so they'll run a, um, uh, a dryer vent line into a five gallon pail. You know, it's. Uh, you know, your situation is partly going to be determined by, you know, your environment and what tools you have to work with and stuff. But yeah, um, any reasonable precaution that you can take. take. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I know guys that are 90 years old and have been spraying uh, paints with toluene in them uh, since they were 12. And uh, they're happy. Uh, but, uh, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's, a spray booth uh, is a reasonable precaution. Um, a respirator is a reasonable precaution. Uh, at the very least, a dust mask uh, is a good idea. For it, so. And where you're most going to realize that is your base coating. Because your base coating is when you're working with your broadest spray patterns and your most airborne uh, particle matters. Uh, the nozzle 
is it universal or do you get different nozzles? Do you have options? For um, that's a good question. Probably something I should have covered uh, earlier because it is a common misnomer. Um, airbrushes, uh, a lot of airbrush brands have fine, medium, large, 135, um, stuff like that. Your nozzle size, most people think it means it's the fineness of the line that you create. And that's only part of the equation, it's actually the lesser part of the equation. It actually refers to the media that you should be putting through the airbrush. Okay, Your, one three, your ones and your fines um, are inks, water, colors, dyes. Your, your, uh, your threes and your mediums are acrylics, um, enamels, lacquers, more pigmented, properly reduced materials. And then your largest tend to be acrylic latex, uh, stuff like that, a little more uh, viscous material. So, so your nozzle sizes tend to refer more to uh, the media you can put through, through the airbrush. Now, that being said, the thing in the year 2012, you know, that's uh, possibly a top three most common question is what size is your nozzle? Most people don't even know why they're asking it, but they're asking it because that's what's been put out there. So that's what I need to know is what size is the nozzle. Okay, um, a .15 nozzle, just about the only thing you'll get to go through it well on a recurring, consistent basis is an ink, a watercolor, or a dye. Okay, you can get other things through it, but man, you're asking for a lot of frustration um, unnecessarily, in my opinion, uh, based on you know that the the slightest difference you get in the atomization. Uh, that airbrush just doesn't seem to warrant the amount of frustration that you'll have getting things that aren't designed to go through that airbrush to go through it. Um, point 21 isn't too far off with that, but you know if your uh, contest entry, museum quality, um, aspirations, um, you need to at some point maybe try to get down to that point where you understand your paint manipulations and your air pressures enough that you can get that size nozzle um, to work for you consistently and enough that you enjoy the painting process. Um, but generally, 0 .3, 0 .4 nozzles are good places to start uh, with. I think you'd be very happy with the finishes you can create, with the atomization that you get. Remember, you're spraying dots. The finer the dot, the more control that you have over it. A 0 .3 nozzle airbrush gives you a pretty fine dot pattern. You're talking ballpark 100 to 120 microns. Um, the human hair is 88 microns in diameter, so it gives you an idea uh, of what you're working with. So, um, you know, your, your Iwata HP series, our Badger Renegade series, the hotter steam mix series, the .21 nozzles are going to give you about 80 micron dots. So, just to give you some idea of what you're working with there. Any other questions? Anything that you hope to learn or find out that you haven't yet? Okay, cool. Well, thank you all for thank giving you. me thank some you. of your time. Thank you. Thank you.